is Dr. Peter Silberberg. Bob will be discussing the brave new world of psychedelics and he'll be piquing your curiosity in how this old class of psychotherapeutics is making a comeback in the last 10 years. In particular, how do they work? Where might they be used? What is their evidence and are they safe? Welcome everyone to tonight's Nordox webinar, Brave New World. My name is Peter Silberberg. I'm a GP at Lennox Head Medical Centre and Aboriginal Medical Service in Lismore, Rekindling the Spirit. I'll be your presenter for tonight's webinar. Just a reminder that Nordox is a network of all doctors, including GPs, specialists, doctors in training, living and working in the geographic geographical footprint that extends from the Queensland border to Grafton. Education is one of our aims to support our members and a reminder that our previous webinars can be found on our website and in the chat box you'll hopefully find a link to a YouTube channel. We're now live on YouTube and you can watch the last three webinars from the last three months. So the learning outcomes for tonight, what do we hope for you to walk away with? Well, a better understanding of the burden of mental health in Australia and a review of the evidence for antidepressant medication. And then with that in mind, thinking about the future, we're going to turn our minds to psychedelics and a better understanding of the mechanism of how they work. We're going to review some of the current evidence supporting the use of psychedelics and have a chat about some of the possible future utilisations. Now there might be lots of questions during the uh, webinar tonight and we'd encourage you to use the chat box um, rather than the Q&A box, the chat box please, and we'll endeavour to get to all the questions as we move along the event. So I'd like to make a warm welcome to our guest speaker tonight, Dr Bob Lodge. Uh, Bob is a consultant physician in internal medicine and before moving to Bangalore in 2002 he had various other hospital positions in coronary care, stroke, in internal medicine and he has a special interest in heart disease, neurology and diabetes. Welcome Bob. Thanks Pete. And so, um, yeah so this is a bit, bit of a different topic for you tonight so just briefly tell us why you're presenting this subject as a general physician and what your interest is in this area. Uh, well first thing to say is I'm not here to sell psychedelics and I'm, I'm not a uh, not a space uh, uh, pilot or I've, I'm not actually a user of psychedelics or ever have been but I think it's uh, it's about time that we moved on a little bit in psychiatry and so this this is sort of a born out of curiosity and as I'll explain as we go along there I've sort of had some personal sort of inspirational in the way from people I've met and I'll, I'll talk about that. So just to start, I, I've called it Brave New World, which I've plagiarised from one of the uh, experts in the area of psychedelics, who himself had plagiarised the term from um, Aldous Huxley, who himself had plagiarised the term from Shakespeare. So uh, we've been using Brave New World for a while. So um, Brave New World was Aldous Huxley, and he actually wrote a, a book about 20 years after Brave New World uh, about the doors of perception, which was his own experience with psychedelics with mescaline. Um, and that became sort of uh, one of the Bibles for people who are interested in psychedelics. So the talk tonight is going to be a bit, bit about psychedelics, particularly uh, magic mushrooms on the left, a little bit about the brain as we understand it in this area. And the the issue is why why am i as a sort of really a general physician talking about this tonight and i think there are several reasons why i think any of you out there would say uh, would ask the same questions or make the same points as i'm about to make just to start this talk the first thing to say is that for whatever reason we seem to have increasing problems mental health issues in australia and the question is uh how are we doing in this lucky country of ours that uh donald Horn wrote about 50 years ago, and we're not doing really well. So one in eight people, one in eight Australians at present are on antidepressants. 44 million Aussies filled scripts for mental health um, medications last in 2019, 2020. And, and the issue I, I ask and we all should ask is why are we in this 
particularly lucky country, despite COVID and all the rest of it, why are we so miserable? And are we so miserable? And according to the OECD, um, 20 years ago and more recently, five years ago, Australia finished up as the uh, second largest per capita user of antidepressants of the 30 countries for which data was available. And only little old Iceland, tiny Iceland, frozen, dark, miserable Atlantic winters, and I've been to Iceland, I can understand why it could be depressing, had a higher per capita depressant rate. And th these, just a couple of very quick slides just to set the scene, and I don't want you to go through these in great difficult, great detail, but on the, um, the, the left, a percentage of males who have got um, mental health conditions lasting for more than six months, this is data from 2018 from the um, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. So about 20% of males over the age of 15 and 25% of, of females over 15 have a significant long-term issue, which is a frightening figure. Dreadful slide here, um, but it, there's, if, if I took it apart, it would make a little bit more sense. But just to say, as you move from left to right, from 2012 to 2000, 2013 up to 2017, 2018, all the percentages of all the age groups there have an increased use of um, antidepressants. And in fact, if we get down to the very far right-hand side, uh, if you look at um, adults over the age of um, 18, 15% of people being prescribed um, antidepressants, which again is, you know, frightening sort of figures. So the other reason we should be discussing this tonight, if, if there are significant problems with mental health in Australia, why, why aren't we doing better? We've now got all these huge advances in recent years. We understand neurotransmitters, a lot about neuropharmacology. We can do functional MRIs. We've got fancy PET scans with fancy traces. So we understand a lot more about the brain, but we don't seem to be doing any better. And I, I'm, as everyone, or anyone who knows me knows with my gray hair, I've been around for long enough um, to be able to sort of discuss what's happened over the last nearly half century. And the medications which we have, particularly for depression and anxiety, have not changed significantly in the last 50 years. Uh, you know, there's a couple of new ones like um, uh, Belsoma and things for, um, for sleep. But um, the drugs that we were being taught about when I started medicine in the early 70s, uh, the, anti, uh, the tricyclics, the mipramine, amitriptyline, which have been around for 10 or 15 years before that, we're still using. And the variations that we've developed since then like the SSRIs are really just mild variations. And I think back to the mid seventies, we were treating peptic ulcers in those days with um, vagotomy and nasogastric milk. That's, that's how I, I was on the ward doing those sort of things. We'd not heard about prostaglandins. We vaguely only understood something about the renin angiotensin system and now it's such an important sort of part of our treatment. But dis, despite all those advances, we go through lots of them, the, the psych side of things doesn't seem to change. We've moved people out of lunatic asylums and mental hospitals into the community, but we haven't advanced far as, as far as the, the, the pharmacology is concerned. And we, I think all of us have been to many, many um, talks about the newest and best antidepressants coming on the, and, anti, uh, and anxiolytics. Um, often there have been just pharma, pharmacologically sponsored trials and the question is, have, have, have we improved anything at all? And you know, a really sort of silly question is, um, are antidepressants actually better than placebo? And I'm just gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, so I wanna just show you two slides, which are quite interesting. Uh, three slides, in fact. This is, uh, if anyone has read about the topic in the last few years, the, um, this is called the Cipriani paper, which showed that um, uh, of the 21 antidepressants regularly available around the Western world. And they did an analysis of, of how well they worked. And they came up with a slide that looked like that, uh, in, which was um, the effectiveness and the acceptability of lots of the, the trials and you compared to placebo and it all looked pretty impressive. And the bottom line in, in this uh, meta-analysis was that we're, the antidepressants are better. But then within a year, people started pulling that apart. And there's this article in the BMJ 12 months later, two years ago, which concluded 
the evidence does not support the, the definitive conclusions regarding the benefits of antidepressant uh, in depression in adults, unclear whether antidepressants are more efficacious than placebo. That's quite a provocative thing to say to Big Pharma. And this slide, um, and again, I don't want you to concentrate on it in any great length, except to see along the um, x-axis, it's from 1980 to 2000, so over 20 years. And there's, there's three lines there which are connecting a whole series of uh, trials and results. The black line along the bottom is the response to, in depression to placebo over 20 years. And as you can see, the response seems to be have improved by 40, 45% over that time. And you sort of think, well, that says something about the trials if placebo is getting better. And it's moving at about the same rate as the two upper um, lines, which one is for SSRIs and one's for tricyclics. And the difference between placebo and, and tricyclics and SSRIs hasn't changed. So something funny about the trials if placebos are getting better. And then the, the, the bottom line is that all of us every day, every day are dealing with patients who are actually having adverse effects to all of these various drugs, which we've been, um, um, these are the only sort of uh, pharmacological tools we have and people with weight changes, libido problems, dry mouth, tightness, et cetera. So they're not, we're not sure they're terribly effective and we're certainly sure that they pr produce side effects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about psych uh, psychedelic drugs tonight. There's a whole list of them. I'm going to just concentrate to a small, a very small number on um, psilocybin, LSD and uh, MDMA, which you know in the party world is ecstasy. But there's a whole lot of other ones which we could be discussing, you know, things like ayahuasca, which has been used for thousands of years, for example. So the, what is the background story to psychedelics? Why aren't we using them? Back in 1938, a Swiss uh, chemist sort of fell upon um, the discovery of, uh, he made LSD. He was trying to find a respiratory stimulant from ergot alkaloids, found LSD, made a mistake. He got a bit of it on the end of his finger, tasted his finger, had a little minor trip and then went and did um, a huge amount of research over the years on LSD and then eventually on psilocybin and, uh, and its active component, um, uh, psilocin. And then he eventually authored a sort of a famous sort of book in, in the area um, called Mind Sorgan Kind, which is my problem child, because he realized it was a difficult, difficult um, compound. But interestingly, uh, Albert Hoffman lived to 102 and he was a regular, Tripper, and I don't know if there's a message in, in that. Then in the 1950s, so we are talking nearly 70 years ago, 65 years ago, psychedelics were the wonder drugs. They were used in all forms of psychotherapy and end of life anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder or uh, war neurosis or battle fatigue, whatever it was called in those days, um, alcohol dependence in which up to 50% of people stopped drinking. So very successful. And by the 60s, LSD had been prescribed to at least 40,000 patients in the US, lots of sci thousand scientific papers, dozens of books, cover stories in time and life. So it, this was sounded like this is the way forward. But then the psychedelics got out of the clinic and got into the counterculture movement. And, uh, you know, best to say a moral panic ensured where, where there was the battle lines between the counterculture movement of the 60s with, with the music of, uh, of the Beatles and all the rest of it versus the establishment. And uh, I just want to, shh, I don't know if this, I think everyone recognizes this famous, famous um, cover of the Beatles from 1967. It's fascinating to go through the, the people who they've got in the background who they think were important at that stage. And one of them I'll just point out in the second back row just here uh, with the dark face is Aldous Huxley, um, who had just died two or three years before this. Um, and he, he was sort of a high priest of the counterculture movement. And there are several other figures there. And just a very interesting trivia fact, if anyone wants to running a trivia contest, 
What day did Aldous Huxley die? He died on the 22nd of November, 1963, which for anyone who has interest in history, the same day as um, John F. Kennedy died, and the same day as C.S. Lewis of um, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe died. So but they, everyone forgets about them and only thinks about JFK. So, so then what happened after that? So we got into the 1970s, Professor, uh, Professor, President Nixon, Tricky Dicky, got into power and he was very anti anything that would uh, destabilise um, his control. And so a whole series of uh, um, legal uh, acts of, of uh, making psychotropic drugs illegal came in in the UN, the US, the UK. And fascinating to sort of see what could happen to research. So this is a... a um, a graph of psychedelic publications starting in 1950, 1968, and then uh, 1970, and as a percentage of total PubMed publications, and it just disappeared. Fascinating that something scientific could be so destroyed by uh, political um, machinations, and it's not vastly different to what was happening to uh, politics and medicine in Australia with uh, COVID vaccination. Now, I just want to indulge myself for a moment. This is when Pete asked me, why am I talking about this? One of the uh, um, best known um, researchers in the field of, of psychedelics in recent times, a guy called Dave Nutt, who's uh, a UK professor of psychopharmacology. And Dave and I go back to 1983. The very first day I went, I started working in Oxford a thousand, you know, many years ago. Um, I met him. He was a psychiatry, um, so he was uh, MD at the time. We became sort of lifelong friends. And he was he stays with us every couple of years. And, he, and in 2009, he was sitting at our dinner table and uh, had a couple of drinks. And our son walked in, was doing a project for school and said uh, he wanted to ask my wife and myself, do we know anything about LSD? He'd never heard of it at that stage. He knew about marijuana and heroin and things. Dave Nutt started talking. He said, I knew Albert Hoffman before he died. And Albert Hoffman had only died at 102, um, about two or three years before. And he started to tell us about the trials of LSD. And I have to say, I'd been in medicine then for um, too many years, 40 years. And I had never, ever known that there was um, a significant uh, uh, pharmacological uh, medicinal role of LSD. That started me every time I read a little bit about LSD over the next few years, my ears pricked up. And then in the last sort of less than a decade, basically, um, there has been an explosion of decent science about, LS, uh, about psychedelics in, in uh, a whole series of, of, uh, of a whole lot of areas of uh, mental health. And the current two leaders in the world are actually, David Nutt has actually moved his whole attention to this area. And he runs the uh, Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College. And Dave's not, he's no madman. At one stage, he was the, uh, he was the lead advisor to the House of Lords in, um, in the UK. So he's been, had a very impressive uh, research career. And then Roland Griffiths has set up a similar sort of um, unit at Johns Hopkins. And he's also, he was a, uh, you know, he, he's the actual professor of neuroscience as well as psychedelic. I'm just going to spend a couple of moments on how psilocybin works because we don't actually know perfectly well, but psilocybin is a prodrug which gets converted into a psilocin. And it's, it's in, when we say it's in magic mushrooms, it's in at least 200 different mushroom species. And the, uh, the recreational users would know which of the, the mushrooms to get it from. We, th we think uh, at least one of its roles is that it works as an agonist on um, 5 ht ht 2 a receptors, serotonergic receptors. And uh, ju there's just a little cartoon about how it attaches to receptors and makes the point that like most, anything to do with neurotransmitters, it's never just a single neurotransmitter. So psilocybin probably affects dopamine, histamine, um, noradrenergic receptors. So it's, 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 it's reasonably complex and we're still working that out. We wonder whether um, psilocybin, one of its actions is actually um, th through the effects on neuroplasticity, possibly that it actually 
increases the sort of um, the dendritic spines and various synapses that would, would not have been there and before treatment with the before treatment with psychedelics. And this is, I think, if you could just concentrate this one for one moment, because I think it's a fascinating um, way of explaining um, the psychedelics. On the left um, is, this is using mainly functional MRIs, how different parts of the brain, so around the outside, the different colors are, are different sections of the brain. They might be, you know, occipital cortex, might be sort of frontal cortex, and the connections between them. And most of them, you'll find that, the, you know, let's say the blue is all frontal cortex, most of its connections are between itself and only just a few you know, to the other side of the brain. When people have a psychedelic like um, psilocybin, a huge increase in connections to different parts of the brain, there's this huge disruptive uh, um, set of connections, which sort of is consistent with some of the uh, stories of trips that people have had with psychedelics. And if you put all that into a bit of a, a very quick sort of slide, we can sort of say there is an increase in connectivity in the brain. The concept of entropic brain activity that um, the brain becomes quite disrupted for a while during psilocybin. And so there's, there's an increased uh, entropy. Uh, um, it's highly disruptive. A lot of the, the normal sort of calm parts of the brain have actually taken out of action for a while. And there's no doubt that um, probably through uh, 5-HT to a receptors, there's a significant increase in neuron excitability. Now, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about how they might work just for the moment because it's, um, it's still been worked out. So for us who are not uh, psycho neuropharmacologists, but who will actually one day be having to uh, be asked questions about what's, you know, is, uh, are these safe? Are they effective? I want to just touch on just a few quick little areas of, that give us some sense of that. So um, R. Griffiths, Roland Griffiths, this is the Johns Hopkins sort of group. Um, and he, he spoke, this is back in, I think, 2008 or so. And I've got a little tiny um, quote of what he said at the time about psilocybin producing mystical type experiences um, of, of, of quite significant personal meaning. And I want you, just before I start this guy, just to remember he's a serious uh, neuroscientist with over 450, 500 publications and things. And just listen to 20 seconds of him here. 80% of the volunteers in that study, after having one or two high doses of psilocybin reported that the experience was among the five most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their lives. And in fact, about 50% said it was the single most personally and spiritually significant experience of their life, comparing it, for instance, to the birth of a firstborn child. So quite, quite a significant sort of comment there. And so over the last few years, there has been a, a explosion of, of decent science in the area. And I'm just going to show three, as it turns out, and just tiny bits. So this is a, um, a, a trial from, uh, this is David Nutt and the team in uh, Imperial College um, with uh, using psilocybin and resistant depression. And I just want to read the conclusion, which I, I can't quite read it all there. There we go. What they said is, although limited conclusions can be drawn about treatment efficacy from open label trials, toler tolerability was good, effect size is large and symptom improvements apparent after just two psilocybin treatment sessions. That's a tablet on two occasions, you know, usually three weeks apart. And just to finish off, they say uh, psilocybin represents a promising paradigm for unresponsive depression that warrants further research in double blind randomized controlled trials. And so early this year, out came one of those randomized controlled trials from pretty much the same group. And this was editorialized in the uh, New England journals. You know, so it's a significant paper and to get it in the New England Journal of Medicine when it was totally full of COVID was quite a significant achievement anyway. And I, there's just, I'm gonna show you just two uh, uh, other slides out of this. The top one is, um, the response 
to, uh, with psilocybin, which is the, uh, the, the red, um, escitalopram, which is the blue, in changes in depression scores. And the lower the de depression score on this, the better. And as you'll see, psilocybin dropped uh, a little bit further than escitalopram, but, but it wasn't significant. And then in the bottom half in B, there was a, a well-being score, and it was, uh, uh, which was not a major, uh, was not one of the uh, pre-specified outcomes, but it showed that people felt better than they did. None of us are surprised about that when they were taking psilocybin. And this was a properly controlled, double-blinded, uh, well, it wasn't double-blinded, a properly controlled, um, uh, blinded sort of a study uh, where they're actually, um, patients got either a the full dose of psilocybin th three weeks apart and then uh, placebo tablets. And the other side got uh, escitalopram at 10, 20 milligrams a day and two doses of very low dose psilocybin that would be uh, unaffected, uh, ineffective. And just to have a look at the bottom here, this change in the depressive symptom score dropped down by eight in the psilocybin by six in the escitalopram, but as you can sort of see that the actual confidence uh, limits of uh, intervals of 0.5, minus 0.5 to 0.9 cross unity. So it wasn't quite significant, but it really was encouraging. And I'll, I'll, I'll actually leave that, except to say that their conclusion was larger and longer trials required to compare psilocybin with established antidepressants. Bob, just before you go on, there was a question from the um, attendees about the potential for these medicines to be addictive. Okay, uh, um, and, and very important. Uh, in about two minutes, can I answer that? Go for it. Okay, so I, I've just I've just picked out a couple of um, sort of trials. So this is a meta-analysis of LSD for alcoholism, um, and I'll just briefly sort of show. The outcome, this was a meta-analysis of six trials, 536 patients, where they, they use a very strange way of describing, and I don't know a lot about alcohol so trials, but they, um, the outcome was uh, what, uh, what patients had a decrease in the misuse of alcohol. And the odds ratio was almost two, that almost twice as many people in the active, the LSD group compared to placebo, um, had a decrease in misuse of alcohol. And then a completely separate issue, but this, is, this is, will have quite some relevance if you can just stick with me for a moment. The use of psilocybin in cancer patients who've got depression and anxiety. So again, Roland Griffith's group came out with a, a, a trial five years ago um, showing substantial and sustained decrease in depression and anxiety in patients with life-threatening cancer. And again, it was a properly control, you know, proper double blind control trial. And I just want to show you just a couple of things that are interesting. These top two things are about um, depression. The bottom two ones are about anxiety. And I just want to make the point that they, they had both a low dose, which is really a, almost a placebo dose and a high dose. And they were able to show that um, at the end of five weeks, there was a significant reduction in depression and anxiety on using on the uh, number of patients who actually you know, responded to a questionnaire. And that response was still seen at six months in depression and anxiety. And you're sort of thinking, hang on, what's going on here? But a, um, a one-off treatment can, can give people six months of relief in such a difficult condition. So I move on to this slide here, and this is not my lounge room, uh, but this is a room I am familiar with. This is a room at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne where I spent a quarter of a century at one stage. And I know exactly this room because it's two doors down from uh, the, oncology, the oncology, the main sort of room where we actually administer drugs and things. And this room is called the retreat. And it's, uh, it's, in, it's the oncology day ward at, uh, at St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne but it, you know there is sort of um, sandalwood candles and all the rest it looks looks like you know a lounge room of the northern rivers and so St Vincent's last year started on the first psychedelic clinical trial of, of, of patients using psilocybin 
um, with psychotherapy in terminally ill patients who've got overwhelming depression or anxiety. This was started at the very beginning of last year, and then of course COVID came along. And so I think when I last found out about this a few weeks ago, there was um, 18 patients. They haven't got up to the 40 patients yet. But this, you know, I, I know St Vincent's very well, you know, conservative sort of good hospital, but found the trials have been done overseas, particularly by Roland Griffiths, were too important to ignore. And this trial involves just a single dose, uh, a, a capsule of psilocybin. And then the patient uh, is watched for three to four hours by trained psychotherapists, and a really important part of it, but it's not just um, anyone, you know, the cleaner or, or one of the oncology nurses. These are people who are properly trained to act, actually help people through this journey. And then obviously they, um, they, if they re reply with um, questionnaires, qualitative outcomes. So just to, so to set for the last few minutes, um, this is a little um, chart I put together to try and compare the way I sort of see the standard therapy versus psychedelics. And standard therapy, you know, most days, most of us are using SSRIs. So when we give SSRIs, we give it to people for, you know, I always say to people, you're on this for three to six months to start with, and we'll see how we go from there. But as we know, many people are on for years for life. We always tell people it's going to take three, four weeks before it starts working. Whereas psychedelics, it's one, two or three treatments spread over two or three weeks, typically with a, uh, an onset of action that afternoon. Totally necessary for... Um, psychotherapy support for psychedelics, which is, and they have to be very well trained sort of people. As we know it, with SSRI, sometimes we can't get access, access to that sort of level of support. The next line is of mode of action is very questionable. And if we have time, I can sort of try and um, uh, argue my case, but in some ways the SSRIs can be seen as sort of symptomatic treatment and the way we actually treat lots of symptoms in medicine without dealing with the underlying problem. Whereas the one way of thinking about the psychedelics is that they, um, uh, this expression again from the British group, they open the therapeutic window to the brain to facilitate insight and emotional release. And with psychotherapeutic support to actually just revise how they look and think about life. So it's, a, it's getting to the root of the problems. As far as what conditions, we know the SSRI is very helpful, depression, anxiety, panic attacks. But the surprising thing is psychedelics have this extraordinary range of conditions which they've been used for and have had, and there is a, a body of evidence. And the other interesting thing is the, the tricyclics, the SSRIs have been around for 55, 60 years. In some shape or form, psychedelics have been around for thousands of years, you know, often in sacred rites and the uh, ayahuasca's and things, um, but medicinal use also by shamans. So what are the problems? Well, the problem is the perception and that, that perception is the P's as far as I'm concerned. Pa patients think we're mad if we talk about psychedelics, or some of them do. All practitioners, whether we're um, medical or allied health or um, including um, all various forms of, of psychologists, not sure about it. And then obviously politicians, because at the end of the day, they have so much control over the TGA and FDA, et cetera. Second problem we have is, uh, this is a new area which we do not have um, adequately trained psychotherapists sort of walking up and down the uh, you know, streets of Lismore or Byron or something at this stage, but there is a lot of work going into improving that. Thirdly, um, we don't know enough about the adverse effects for, with um, different doses and different timing and things. And so that's a terribly important area to be followed. And obviously, if we're gonna start paying for psychotherapists to be um, sitting around for several hours, this could be expensive and whether it's ever, uh, you know, whether it's gonna be ever Medicare funded or public or private's yet to be sorted out. But, but the, the, this is the, probably the question is um, how dangerous what are the concerns about mental health? And so this is a study, um, I'm just trying to think about six, six years ago in the Journal of Psychopharmacology, where they actually uh, surveyed 130,000 adults to find out uh, 
and this is, you know, it's an open study. It's got, there's lots of problems with this, but, you know, it was their best attempt to try and find out is there a connection with mental health problems. And the, the final line in the conclusion of this was, um, psychedelics are not known to harm the brain or other body organs or to cause addiction or compulsive use. Serious adverse events involving psychedelics are extremely rare. And that finished up overall, it's difficult to see how prohibition of psychedelics can be justified as a pure health measure. So with that in mind, where are we up to um, with psychedelics? So here we are in the, the States. And I showed you that slide um, about when LSD got thrown out in the um, 70s. Well, here's the opposite happening. Over the last 20 years, the number of this is not papers, this is, this is the number of actual clinical interventional trials in the US um, using psychedelics. And, and the numbers are increasing. And if we go the last two to three years, I think uh, it's sort of uh, the, the curve will be rising even faster. The American College of, um, of Psychiatrists um, in their journal, the American Journal of Psychiatry, um, this is last year, beginning of last year, February last year, did a review of, of where are we up to with psychedelic um, uh, assisted psychotherapy and psychedelics. And if it's, it's worth just reading this for a moment. The conclusion was randomized clinical trials support the efficacy of MDMA in the treatment of PTSD. And since then, there's been quite a, um, the FDA has actually given approval now for phase three trials with PTSD. And then secondly, for psilocybin, the treatment of depression and cancer-related anxiety, and then um, possibly the use of LSD and ayahuasca in various other psychiatric conditions. So it, it was a sort of a, a, a positive but guarded sort of response. So here we are in Australia. Uh, and this is my last slide, so hopefully we've got some time to have a, uh, quite a chat. In March 2021, um, an application we put in last year to get psilocybin and MDMA ecstasy moved from Schedule 9 to Schedule 8. And Schedule 8 drugs in Australia include ketamine, morphine, cocaine, etc. And if you read any of the British uh, things, they're talking about getting it from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, that they move in the opposite direction to us there. And the application was rejected. And a lot of people who know something about the area said that was, that was pretty ham-fisted because um, lots of the, they, didn't, they didn't look at much in the way of the reports out of the last, um, you know, perhaps six to eight years. Uh, and so uh, various people said, well, you know, can we actually put in another application? And so another application was put in and has was considered last week, first week of November, and the uh, decision from TGA about whether to move from Schedule 9 to Schedule 8 will come out in the first week of December, three weeks' time. And the, there's reasonable evidence, or a reasonable um, belief that uh, we'll get to get Schedule 9 to Schedule 8 with psychedelics, which would at least mean it is easier to perform clinical trials in this country, so miles away from actually having it readily available for patients, say, with resistant um, depression. But the fascinating thing is, and I, uh, I'll declare myself politically a little bit, I think our, our government, uh, our current federal government is, um, is, as we know, is a conservative government, and uh, we have difficulties getting them to see some of the, the, the modern ways that we should view the world. But despite that, back in March this year, the, the, uh, the federal government uh, granted $15 million towards the use of psychedelic uh, trials using the use of psychedelic drugs like magic mushrooms. And that, um, you know, this is only five years after um, medicinal cannabis was um, made uh, legal in this country. And it's sort of, for many people, encouraging that we're actually opening up our eyes to possible therapies, given that some of the things we've been using for the last 60 years haven't worked so well. So I know I've rushed through that very quickly. And uh, uh, as, as the slide there says, th this is very, very much not, not the uh, end. And uh, it's, uh, it's just the beginning. There will be trials 
um, study to pour through the, the literature. There will be comments in our common um, in our commonly available medical journals. You won't have to read the Journal of Psychopharmacology, but you know mainstream journals like New England Journal and um, Lancet and BMJ are, 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 are very happy to publish the trials now because I think we all realise that we didn't stick with um, bagotomy and nasogastric milk in the, the 70s. We moved on and we found out what caused peptic ulcers and uh, we don't have, when I was a, when I was a, uh, a medical student, young doctor, we used to have a hematemesis and Molina award in every hospital uh, because we were seeing them every day on tape. That's something that's forgotten. But depression, anxiety, we're still pretty much treating the same way now as we were then. Pete, that's all I've got to say for the moment. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions and talk about whatever. That's if I can. Dangerous. Depends on whatever, <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll stick with uh, with this now. So thanks, Bob. That was a, a bit of a tour de force of of where this topic has been. It has certainly got an interesting history. So j just going back to the um, the one about addiction. So I mean, my understanding is that these drugs aren't addictive, and there's um, very or no known lethal dose, or it's virtually impossible to have a lethal dose. That's correct in your understanding too. That, that, that is my understanding. And I, I think um, I, you know, everyone knows about awful stories at um, uh, pop festivals and all the rest of it about people who have seemingly taken a large dose of, or taken a dose of ecstasy and something. And all we know is that uh, uh, in the clinical trials, when people are being um, given a prescribed dose we know of, and we know it's not mixed with uh, gunpowder or something, that there uh, are no reported cases of addiction. And the, but you know, that's such an important thing to find out more about the safety. But I think the idea that addiction is a problem is, is a, a nonsense and it's, you know, that's in the opiate part of the world. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, uh, so um, keep those questions coming in. I notice in our panelists here, we've got some um, people with quite a lot of experience in drug and alcohol so and mental health. So please, please keep the questions coming. Um, so any risk about developing a psychiatric disorder? So, you know, we talked about warning teenagers about, you know, first onset psychosis if you experiment with magic mushrooms and this kind of thing. Do you know where these trials are sort of, how these trials are dealing with that conundrum? Uh, well, I do know that that at this stage in, and I know I haven't gone through exhaustively through the trials, but they have, uh, it's, it's like most um, drug trials, that there's significant exclusions about who gets into the trials. <clears throat> and I think, um, uh, and I, 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 you know, I am not the expert in this by a long way, but I think if people have had a significant um, uh, psychotic episode, in particular psychotic episode with, uh, with, with, um, presumably with psychedelics, they're all excluded. So it's, it, uh, you know, that's where we've got to work our way um, through that. And it's the same whether you trials in diabetes or something, they, they rule out all the um, fat people who have got heart disease before they get in them. So um, with, with lots of, the, the way I sort of see lots of medications and, uh, and even sort of um, surgical therapies and things, we get past the sort of phase three, phase four trials, and it's only when things are out into the open that we actually ever get true confidence about who we use these therapies for and how safe they are. Today's talk was only just to give some concepts and to say there is information starting to come out there. As I said, I've, I'm not here, I'm not paid by anyone to actually push these things, but there is, um, uh, given the burden of, um, of mental health issues we have in Australia and given the burden of adverse effects with the agents we've got at present, we would be failing our patients if we didn't look a little bit wider. Um, yeah, absolutely. And there's a, just a message here from, um, from one of the panellists who um, does drug and alcohol work saying there's a discussion, are we risk of addiction more in terms of behavioural addiction? or to the experience of taking a psychedelic rather than actual substance dependence or tolerance, such as with alcohol and opiates. Thanks, Thanks for that, that comment there. Um, so 
Are you, uh, I don't know if you've read the trials enough, but someone was wondering if there were any sort of specific adverse events at the time of you taking the psychedelic in the trials, you know, like I guess, I'm guessing nausea or having a panic attack or anything like that. I'm not sure if you read the trials enough or had spoken to David about it perhaps. Uh, look, I don't think I, yeah, I don't think I can make a, a, a real answer to that or uh, give it an honest answer, but um, I, it is very clear um, when people talk about how uh, to get uh, to get to ethics committees and uh, safety committees, how important it is to have highly trained psychotherapists there because um, it is a rocky road for some people. It's not this, just this beautiful floating on cloud sort of thing. Um, and particularly for conditions like uh, people have had significant trauma and PTSD, um, but those situations, we're talking you know, very, um, um, uh, precariously balanced sort of uh, states of mind. And so um, we need to have properly trained psychotherapists there to deal with those. But if you're asking about physical adverse effects, I think they are uncommon, very uncommon. Yeah, and um, uh, David Hellowell, who's well-known alcohol and drug um, doctor in the region, has just said, like surgery, psychedelic psychotherapy sessions are definitely safe within safe hands. Um, thanks for that, David. So, and what about, like in the start of the um, show, you know, you were talking a lot about placebo and, you know, that the benefit from the drug trials with SSRIs was uh, better than placebo, but not hugely better. Um, do you have any sort of feeling about whether these drugs are going to be the same in terms of their efficacy, or you think they're pointing towards a better um, improvement that perhaps or the same with just better tolerance, given that you only have to maybe have it once or twice? Uh, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't have strong professional um, opinion about that because I'm, I'm, I'm not in, in the area, but I, I have read a lot and I've spoken to enough people about it that um, I, I, I really uh, believe that the, uh, if we're trying to treat the underlying cause rather than symptoms, we're, we're, we are more likely to do better than just with placebo um, because we're you know, trying to open the mind up. And this is where some of this whole, even though there's lots of very smart neuroscientists involved in this, there is still a, 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 a huge block of the brain that we don't understand that we might put under the term mind. Um, and we, we don't, we can't understand that in terms of neurotransmitters and, and synapses and things. And so, um, uh, I, I, yeah, and when you read the people who've written a lot in the area, there's always this sort of let off clause that we wish we understood better how, how this all works. We're guessing at, at how it works. Um, and uh, again, so, do you understand how many of the drugs we use in medicine really work. I'm not sure I know how metformin works. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. No, you're very absolutely right. Um, and, and that's the lovely thing about medicine is that uh, we, there should be, all of us should be curious enough to find out about uh, what's happening. Unfortunately, we have some very smart people who are curious in this area. It's no longer sort of um, out there in the sort of, um, you know, it's only the crazies who are talking about psychedelics. It's, it's wonderful to see it come into mainstream um, neuropsychology, neurobiology sort of studies. Um, someone has asked, you may not know the answer to this one, Bob, but somebody else might on the panel where there's been any, any comparisons um, with ECT in the literature. Um, I'd almost say for certain there isn't. Um, and again, just having, um, uh, in, in, in fact, I'd, I'd be, almost 100% certain there isn't because it would be a very, very difficult, it's such a, such a highly regulated area, so incredibly difficult to get research at present, uh, even though you know, I showed you that 112 trials already in the, uh, the States. Um, when, again, just speaking to the British people, but to David Nutt, to get um, ethics com um, committee uh, acceptance of these trials safety committees is very difficult. So the answer is no, uh, I, I don't know. But, it, but could, I, could I just say, and I don't know who, who else is online, but I, I saw a patient um, 
two weeks ago who was actually on five different psychotropic drugs, two, two, two antidepressants and an uh, um, antipsychotic and uh, on lithium and uh, on pregabalin, who had 122 uh, ECT sessions and had spent um, over a year in the last 10 years, more than 365 days in, in a, uh, a private um, psychiatric clinic. And I, I look at things like that as a non-psychiatrist, I'm just a general physician, um, and think uh, that's insanity. Uh, we, we, we in medicine, to continually keep doing something like, and the person's not better from all of that, um, I, I sort of think, well, we have to think about other ways of dealing with, with things. And there is obviously a place for ECT and all psychiatrists would, would tell you that. And we've learned a lot about how to give ECT better over the years. But um, we have been doing ECT for 80 years or whatever it is now. Um, and here's a, a therapy that's came in, looked very attractive, got knocked down by politicians our jobs to actually bring it up and eventually do compare it to ECT and standard therapies because otherwise we're failing our patients. Mm. Yes, and um, and certainly patients are saying talk about it. I know that some of my patients have brought up the topic or um, I may have brought it up myself even, I can't remember. But it's I don't think, I mean, one of the panellists was just wondering whether there's current trials or how could people get, if people want to get involved now, do you know of any that are happening beyond the cancer ones in Australia at St Vincent's? Um, I don't. I, I do know, and I don't know if anyone was listening to Radio National this morning to Fran Kelly, that uh, she was interviewing Monash University has just started a, uh, a neuromedicine discovery team or something, I can't remember the title, to actually, with a plan to um, start running trials out of there in Melbourne. And um, it, there are two or three other places talking about, there's one in Western Australia. So right now, I, just to the best of my knowledge, there is not, I, I couldn't, if, if, and I've seen a couple of patients like, like probably all of us who've said, I want to give it a try. I haven't got a, um, I can't say, look, we can uh, put you into this or that trial for the moment, but I would imagine within 12 months, and particularly if TGA approval comes up on um, in you know two weeks, three weeks' time, that there will be that option. But um, at present, I think we all know it's a bit like medicinal cannabis. There are, there are still people out there um, trialling it in the backyard sort of thing, and that's not what we want to encourage, or that's not what I think we should be encouraging. And uh, there are... Um, well, there is a particular well... Um, or, or well known, but it's getting to be well known organisation um, that you know about too. Bob Mind Medicine Australia. That's probably worth just mentioning here. I mean, they're not a drug company. They're actually um, being donated money by two individuals who want to see this area of medicine to become available and affordable for all Australians. Um, do you want to talk about them briefly, or do you want yeah, to yeah, no. So Mind Medicine Australia is ba it's based in Melbourne. And it's um... It's based by a, just set, set up by a, a philanthropist and, and um, his, his wife, who, who did psychology, but was also a uh, sort of opera singer at one stage. But it has attracted um, some of the, the best and brightest people in Australia, not just from medicine uh, and psychiatry, but um, um, some really interesting people. And I'll just sort of say on the board, you know, one guy is Chris Barry, who was the uh, Head of the Defence Force at one stage, Admiral Chris Barry, who who has spoken a lot about PTSD over the years. There's Andrew Robb, who was the um, minister in the Howard government for industry and trade, who had we all knew about his depression. Uh, but a really impressive group of people who have actually um, they've brought together to actually just uh, to um, a raise some money to be able to push the eye uh, the, the 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 promise potential promise of psychedelics to the TGA, to the federal government. And they're about to have a uh, next weekend, uh, uh, yeah, next weekend, a, um, a world summit is going to be virtual, unfortunately, because lots of these people like Roland Griffiths, Dave Nutt, were all coming out. But it's um, uh, a really impressive um, 
set of, of the best um, researchers, industry, um, community groups coming together to actually talk. And I, I, again, I think out of something like that, where we're pulling people from uh, lots of disciplines together, we've, we've got some chance that this will get the traction that it's required so that it can be researched properly. And, and if it turns out to be a, as potentially uh, helpful that it will get on the road not now, not in another decade or two decades time. And I, I, I can see the end of my medical career coming up at you know, some stage in a decade or something. And I'd love to think that by the time I got out, we were looking after some people resistant depression better than we were in the mid seventies. Yeah, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, and the, the, in, in the chat, there's um, a few links. There's one to Mind Medicine Australia. Um, David Hellerwell's posted another one called maps, M-A-P-S uh, .org. Oh, I don't know that one. I'll have a look at that one. Um, I had a look at Mind Medicine Australia before doing this webinar. There's some free um, short presentations. David Nutt is on some of them. You can listen to him speak. He's a very impressive speaker and he can show you very fancy images and functional MRIs about what happens to different parts of the brain on psychedelics and how that may affect people's therapy. So yeah, I'd be interested, I'd encourage you to um, to have a look at that. And and the other thing is that they're trying to, or My Medicine Australia want to um, organise um, different, well, they've called them chapters, I think, around around the country for people who are, have common interest in this area. The same, um, like Bob. And, and to that end, um, we have a chapter in Byron Bay, that, and uh, so that that started. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't know that. Late last year, I think, and uh, and there is um, a very high level, and I, I won't mention names, a very high level um, of knowledge about uh, training psychotherapists in the Northern Rivers, um, based in Lismore, um, yeah, and. Uh, so it's highly likely that there will be an expert group up here, not just a chapter to raise money or something, that there will be an expert group. And so if trials do eventually start, we, you, we're more likely than not to be able to do it here than having to go to Melbourne or Sydney. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I've got a feeling my mid in Australia might I'll be offering free training for um, therapy. But to that they are, and a certificate that comes with it, yeah. Certificate, yeah. Well, I think we might wrap it up there, um, Bob, but we're almost right on the hour. That's been a fascinating discussion and thanks for everyone um, who's participated in the, um, in the questions. Um, there is just one more slide to say thank you, if we can get there. And um, uh, there'll be a brief survey afterwards, like normal, after, um, if you can please do that for us, um, that helps Nordox. And um, uh, we'll be back again in February 2022. This is our last um, webinar for the year. So thank you for those who have participated and facilitated and come along and joined. Um, it's been really, really interesting. Um, I just want to make one last plug before we go offline. Um, there is a COVID forum on November the 18th um, being run by the local Northern Rivers LHD to be talking about how COVID is currently managed in the community. I know there's a lot of interest in that at the moment. And um, if you'd like to uh, to um, log on to that, then I think hopefully there'll be a link coming up in the chat any second, but um, that's been advertised by the Nordox mail list, but also the PHN has it advertised on the website too. All right. We'll call it a night. Uh, Pete, you. could I just say, just before you go, just thank you very much for organising this and, and Linda and uh, the two Daves. Um, I think it's, a, you know, we've, we've all missed getting together during COVID and this is as close as it gets. And I, I thank you very much for all the work you put into this. So thank you. Yeah, no worries, Bob. Hopefully we can all start meeting face to face. It's certainly yeah. starting to happen a little bit now. So that's great. So thanks everyone. And uh, we'll see you in 2022.